Welcome to Slipper Camp, friends. Uh, today we are talking about the cruelty-free syllabus with Matthew Cheney. So with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Matt. Thanks, Robin. I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Plymouth, uh, and Interdisciplinary Studies lives within the CoLab, so also part of that grand endeavor. Um, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. If I can find it. There we go. All right. Is that sharing? Yep. And Excellent. you just want to hit your presentation mode and you'll be good to go. All right. So here we are. Um, so this is an update to a workshop presentation I gave at. Matt, we are, yep. not see we are not seeing the presentation mode. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not. We're seeing your regular. Oh, I think I know why it's doing. I yeah, have to stop and start. Yeah, you can the back end again if you pick the wrong one. It's fine. Yeah, it always does that. I know, and I can never tell which is which when I'm picking. There we go. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so this is an update to a presentation I gave. I think at University Days or January Jamboree or something like that. All of these uh, before COVID things, which feel like lifetimes ago at this point. Within the ACE uh, framework, it sort of fits into everything at the assignment level and course level uh, because we really are talking about the de design of courses and syllabi. I've called this uh, cruelty-free classrooms rather than just cruelty-free syllabi because as I've been working on this stuff and trying to build out some writing about it, um, I, I felt like the concept of the syllabus was something of an albatross around it um, because it's really not just about a syllabus it's about how we think about what we do within our classrooms so once upon a time we had that old uh, previous presentation which you'll find linked in the uh, this slide deck once that's uh, available uh, it took off, people really liked it. It led to me having a podcast interview on the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast. Um, it seemed to strike a chord with, with lots of people. That was a long time ago because now we are in a different world. So how does this affect some of those ideas as we're thinking about preparing to teach it during COVID-19 as we're redeveloping our coursework uh, and thinking about our relationships with students in perhaps a different way. Well, the initial questions that I asked in the previous presentation were, at graduation time, what do you want your most successful student to remember about your class? And what do you want your least successful student to remember about your class? And that was sort of where we began from, that uh, philosophical uh, uh, brainstorm of how do you want to be remembered? How do you want your class to be remembered? But now I think it feels a little difficult to think about the future. Uh, so much is unknown and uncertain. So much is in fact a little disturbing, but it seems to me important at least to ask ourselves, how do we want our students to look back on us after all this, whatever that may mean? So let's say maybe 10 years from now, uh, when students reminisce about this experience, how do you want them to remember their time with you? So I have a couple of examples here. This first one I found on Twitter, a student at the University of Maryland said that I simply asked my professor for a few days extension on a project because my dad died as a result of COVID-19. And this is the response I get. And she included a screenshot and this is it. The professor said, try to get it done on time. That would be much better. I'd like to be consistent with all students because there are many who are having difficult times. As far as I can tell, this is real. Um, and I, I was aghast. Um, here's a very different sort of experience. This is from Professor Huaji Shin, a sociologist, I think, at the University of San Francisco. She shared to the Higher Ed Learning Collective Facebook group this uh, story where she said um, she was struggling to figure out what to say to her students on the last day of class and so she shared the story of growing up in Osaka, Japan in 1995 when there was a magnitude 7 earthquake 
And she said, during the mega quake, my petite mom walked or more like crawled to each bedroom of her children and our grandma and made sure we were alive and not hurt while our house was shaking massively. When the shaking stopped, she started a fire as there was no gas or electricity and started cooking breakfast outside. She told her family to eat because we all needed strength to cope with what was to come next. Then she told everyone to take a nap together in a living room. She said if we were to die, we should do so together in sleep. As I told my students this story, I apologized that my final message to them was to eat and sleep well during this pandemic. But that is all I know how to do as we endure this precarious time. That wasn't so much what caught my attention on this. It's a, a remarkable story and a compassionate teacher. Um, but she also shared a response she got from the mother of one of her students, a message um, from the mother who said, I wanted to reach out and thank you for your inspirational lectures, your kindness and your honesty. I was lucky enough to be in the same room the first day of your Zoom class and fortunately also the day of your last. They may not realize it now, but when they look back on this crazy time, you'll be on the top of their list of people that really helped them through this. Thank you for helping my son learn and grow as a human. We've had great discussions on a few of our evening walks about what he learned in class. So if we go back to that central question of how do we want students to look back on us after all this in 10 years from now, what will they reminisce about from this experience? I think these provide us two very stark differences. And I think it's within a lot of our power to choose which of these teachers we want to be. Kathy Davidson very recently published an article at the Haystack website. Um, the link is in the presentation slides, so we'll have it up um, for you later. Uh, you could also just Google the title, The Single Most Essential Requirement in Designing a Fall Online Course. And there she said that what we have to remember is that, um, and build into the structure of the assignments are thinking about all this stuff, is that all of our students are learning from a place of dislocation, anxiety, and trauma, and so are we. What that means, ultimately, she says, is we need to adjust accordingly. We need to be human first and a professor second. We need to design as humans for humans in a global crisis. We need to design our courses with the awareness of pain, dislocation, uncertainty, and trauma now central to all of our lives. It's a lot to ask. It is the one and only essential as we design our courses for this disrupted fall. And it's hard, you know, there, I have a little frustration with this piece she wrote. Um, it's just a blog post, so I, shouldn't, I can't hold it against her, but it's not particularly specific about what that means in practice aside from just you know be compassionate but i think it's it's really worth keeping in our minds as a question because i'm not sure there actually is an answer so maybe my frustration isn't even with this blog post but with the situation we find ourselves in is is what then as someone not trained in the the counseling of trauma and not trained in any of this um what what can we do um i have no answer for that so back to thinking about cruelty freeness. Um, in the original presentation, I said there were four areas for attention in my own syllabi where I found um, two places where cruelty could creep in and two places where I thought were, were real oppor areas of opportunity um, that I had discovered in my own work, um, areas of opportunity for reducing cruelty. Um, I felt like I had let a lot of uh, petty cruelty, really, and pettiness creep into my attendance policies and late work policies. Uh, so I really readjusted those. And if you want to see how, um, you can look back to that original uh, presentation, which is, which is linked from this one. Um, and also through adding basic needs statements and thinking about um, the, what seems like such a tiny thing, which is just names. Uh, the policy I now have is that students can tell me whatever name they, they want to be known as um, in class. Um, those were areas of opportunity and I, I tried to increase those and reduce the areas where cruelty could creep in. 
Um, if you want more about this, we have lots of resources on the CoLab website. Um, a lot of them are within our ungrading stuff um, because a, a lot of this ties in along, along with some of the motivations for reducing some of the more negative effects of grading. So you'll find lots in the ungrading resources, but we also have a lot of stuff on basic needs. But now in the, area of, in the era of COVID-19, I've also been thinking about academic integrity and, and not just because I'm on the Academic Affairs Council and, and have been on um, some academic integrity panels, but also just my own development as someone in, in relationship to my own academic integrity policies and experience on various types of academic integrity panels. Um, Susan Bloom has done some great work on it, on of the ethnography of plagiarism. She's an anthropologist and has really studied what students are doing when they plagiarize and what they're thinking. Um, and she has a book on this. Here's a, a Chronicle of Higher Ed essay that she wrote. And something I found really valuable when I, I read this was she, she breaks plagiarism specifically, but I think we can broaden it to think about academic integrity more broadly. She breaks it into a few different approaches that we tend to use as teachers. One is um, thinking about it as a moral error, um, or on the other hand, thinking about it as a crime that would then need to be punished. Um, in neither, in neither case are we really thinking about it what I have now come to think of academic integrity as is an opportunity for teaching and learning. Um, so one of the basic premises of my sort of cruelty free approach is taking from Jesse Stommel the idea that we should start with trusting students. Um, itself a fairly radical idea um, that has changed my practice in lots of different ways. Um, but if we start with that, how can we balance our desire to trust students with the, the definite knowledge that, especially uh, with our new online uh, everything, that students will cheat on exams, for instance, if given the opportunity. And in thinking about this, I've come up with two possibilities. I'm sure there are more, but this is what I was able to come up with. Um, the first is pretty conservative. Uh, the second is somewhat more radical. So I think that first, you can just reduce or eliminate the opportunity for cheating. And secondly, um, more radically, we can change our mindset. Let's start with the more conservative approach. So if we were to reduce or eliminate the opportunity, what does that mean? For me, it's meant, especially when I was first teaching online courses, I began to then assume that every exam I gave was an open book, open notebook, open laptop, open everything exam because it um, the question is always who's frozen me that's, or the that's Matt you or not and the great face he has left on there <laughs> um Let's see. Someone needs to get a picture of him. Professor <laughs> X, where are you? Okay, I'm taking the screenshot of his face right now. <laughs> Glad that's the nice. That seems uh, cool. When we're I'm sure the important things. Let's <laughs> go out and oh, he's not going to look at the chat. Um, let's see. I'll text him on a cell phone. We'll see. Oh, did he figure it out? Tell me if you see him leaving. His connection probably dropped, and so he probably left the Zoom room. I'm just texting him, come back. <laughs> this is actually our first glitch, so I don't think we can complain, friends. Robin, because... when he asks when he froze, just show him that picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I should like, pick up from here. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, yeah, Bridgewater Internet. <laughs> I think he'll be back. We also lost his slide, so you know I can't even impersonate him. Yes, he's, he texted me, got, got bumped out. Yeah, we're aware. <laughs> Robin, it, yes. it might take him a while to get back in. I've noticed I, I had to drop out for a meeting and coming back in, it, I had to crank Zoom up like three different times. Really? Yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll see. We'll just be yeah. patient. It should be okay. Oh, yeah. um, 
Take your time. I'm texting. Take your time. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We're just, you know what? I could pause the recording. That does seem dangerous. Oh, look at you texting me to pause the recording. Okay, I'm pausing the recording. Hey, he's even with me now. All right, we are back after a small tech glitch, and I'm going to turn it back to Matt. It's good for us to experience this because our students will. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing the screen. I can find the right one. Yep, perfect. Okay. I'm not entirely sure where I cut out, so um, I'm just going to continue, and then we can ask questions as people need. All right, so um, another way to reduce or eliminate the opportunity for cheating in classes uh, is to use randomizing tools in things like Moodle. Uh, you can create multiple, I've done this for years, you can create multiple versions of exams relatively easily. Um, Jason, I'm sure, can help a lot with this, um, but especially for if you have a, a large bank of questions, um, you can have Moodle put those out in different order for each student. You can have it choose from uh, questions, etc. There are lots of different ways to do that. Um, and I would encourage working with Jason on that. So I'm going to go, as I always enjoy going to the more radical side, so I'm going to um, think about changing your mindset. So this, this happens to me. I will, I'll give an example from my own practice um, at some point here. But it's really, for me, been about instead of seeing the circumstances that make cheating tempting or even inevitable to students, to see, instead of seeing these circumstances as an obstacle, um, trying in whatever way I can to turn those circumstances into a central element of the pedagogy. Um, so here's an example. Uh, a traditional version of one type of test. And actually, Ben Pike's here, right? So thank you, Ben. Okay. It was a conversation we had that led to this. Um, a traditional version of one type of test asks students to memorize numerous equations and not use the internet to look up those equations. Um, the equations are central to work in the field, so memorizing them seems reasonable. One question we might have about this, though, is have most of the practitioners in the field memorized those equations? If they have, then what were the circumstances of that? For instance, did they perhaps memorize those through repeated use because they're the, they're the equations you use all the time, so you end up memorizing them because that ends up making your work more efficient? Um, if the practitioners look up equations, why should we require students to memorize them rather than demonstrate that they know where to find them and to use that knowledge? So that might lead to a change of mindset where instead of creating an exam where students must memorize a bunch of equations, uh, Professor X on one of his good days decides to create an exam that better mimics real world activities. So it's an exam that asks students to put their research skills into practice, to collaborate on finding information and putting that information to use, turning their information into knowledge, um, which is sort of uncheatable uh, depending on how you set it up. Here's an example from my own experience. This was me. I used to um, in classes, prohibit students from working to ex together on exams, all that stuff that we're used to. Um, being online, when I moved one of my classes um, to an all online course, I've then felt stuck for a little bit, little bit because I knew that it was really easy to do all those things I had, without a whole lot of effort, prohibited students from doing before. Um, and so I my first thing I researched was, you know, how do I look up student IP addresses and that sort of thing. Um, and then I realized I didn't like doing this. I felt much more like a cop than what I would rather be, which is more of a coach or a teacher. Um, so I vividly remember this moment. I was taking one of my old exams and I decided to, to just redo it for the online experience. And I wrote, began writing a sentence that I didn't know the end to. And it was something to the effect of, for this exam, you are welcome and indeed encouraged to use internet resources and to collaborate with your classmates. To demonstrate your knowledge, you will. And then I stopped. <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't know the end of this sentence, but I think figuring out the end of this sentence is going to make for a better learning experience for all of us. Um, and it took real time and thought. So I can also say that 
the effect, the results were some of the best student writing I had ever gotten before. It really opened up the class for me. So then when I next taught the course face to face, um, I kept the same format I had used for the online course because it just led to better results. Um, so once I had changed my mindset about what all this was for and how I was going about it, uh, it was really revelatory. So I will just say in thinking about um, cruelty and such, what and pulling it out of my own work, trying to become less cruel, um, what I've really come down to is, is noticing those moments where I have the urge to punish. I think that was a, a lot of my experience as, as a young teacher, especially, was I thought that part of, a big part of my job was punishment. Um, and that's where a lot of the cruelty crept in. Um, my very first paid teaching job was at Seward Park High School in New York City. And uh, it's this big imposing building. And that building was, before it was a high school, it was the Ludlow Street Jail. And uh, I think at that time, somewhere around that time, I first read Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish, where Foucault says uh, something to the effect of there being a, a lot of overlap between certain types of institutions, such as prisons and schools. And I thought that's very true because it didn't look like they'd done a lot of retrofitting in Seward Park to, to make, uh, make it a high school after it had previously been the Ludlow Street Jail. Um, and I've often thought about how can I, as an individual teacher, reduce the similarity between my classroom and a prison's. Uh, and, and I think it is within our power to, to reduce that similarity. So that's where I, in my own work, I always look to where, where do I find the urge to punish? Because it's, it's often there. It's sort of baked into our cultural idea of the teacher, I think, in many ways. Um, where is that? And why is it coming up in me? And, and how can I mitigate it? All right, that's what you'd like. You know, that's what I've got. Um, if you'd also like to brainstorm and talk through your own course materials, please come by the CoLab anytime. Um, we all like talking about this stuff, um, but also especially this Thursday and Friday, I'm there 8.30 to 5 and, and the rest of us are as well. Um, but now I think I can stop sharing screen and we can go to, oh, look, all of the people. Uh, uh, discussion and, uh, and such, and as you will. We have um, 20 minutes, so we encourage <laughs> folks to share questions or comments and uh, I think it'd be worth just, you know, trying. Um, so first of all, Ben, is there anything in the chat? I kind of, I didn't see anything that looked like it had to be answered. There were no real questions I saw per se. Just pontifications, which is what we encourage. Um, this is the pontification session. Yeah, so I will just encourage anybody who um, has a comment or a thought or a question uh, to throw it out to the group by unmuting your mic and just jumping in. Um, Elliot, if you want, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, Matt. I really like these ideas. I, I use them in my own classes and, and have thought about this um, ever since I was, uh, I had an honor board at West Point, <laughs> um, of all <laughs> places, right? You know, for cheating there, they had some pretty harsh punishments um, or perceived cheating. But I wonder how close we are to getting this into institutional policy and in either in the academic affairs committee where you serve or other places where we do have very draconian and kind of unfriendly uh, policies um, regarding students. And there's a lot of push institutionally to make your syllabi and some other things, your assignments, um, in the ways you describe, kind of unfriendly or un, you know, unpalatable for those of us who are thinking a little more openly about these things. Yeah, institute. It's hard to speak. I can't speak for the institution, and uh, I think that there are there are good signs. Yeah, I think the new academic integrity policy is pretty neat, and I think especially the way that David has been utilizing it, um, he very clearly sees it as um, encouraging us to think about those sorts of things as learning opportunities, as um, more than punishment, if possible. Um, beyond that, uh, I think there's a lot we can do as, as individual faculty. Um, if you, uh, 
I, I can put a link to how we I've set up my syllabi on our collab website. Um, you can see where that plays in. Liz is saying in the chat that this really connects to grading and it very much does. That's why a lot of the, uh, the stuff we do with ungrading fits into here. I think that there is, there is an openness um, institutionally to a lot of different ideas and especially right now to experimentation. I ask a question? It's Denise. Um, so I'm just curious what people are thinking about in terms of attendance and attendance policies, given the fact that, you know, obviously this semester is difficult. We don't know what next semester will bring. And I know it's important to me to have students as part of my class and that we're talking and conversing and learning together. So I'm, I'm curious as to kind of what the new methods might be or could be. That's a great question. I have been thinking about attendance. I have a very loose attendance policy right now, and I've been thinking about how to adjust it even for the fall. Um, I would have to look back. Yeah, I think um, looking back on my attendance policy, I might be able to share screen to what that actually is, because I don't have it here in front of me, and I haven't, I've been looking at other things. Um, but yes, trying to figure out ways to build flexibility in and what even counts as attendance now. Right. right. Um, it could be discussion boards. Right. <laughs> yeah. Going yeah. Up as, but it's hard to count all these things and track all of these things. And, you know, it's right. What's well, high flex attendance, right? That's what I'm asking, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Something so. like the like the obscenity policy right i know it when i see it where you can identify at certain points that something is wrong like i know a lot of us have talked about when that guy called in to um the exchange we were talking about remote learning and he called in and said i teach at saint anselm's college and i demand that all my students be there synchronously for their 8 a.m class and, and then he acknowledged that some of his students were now in California and he was still requiring them to synchronously attend a Zoom class at what was now the equivalent of 5 a.m. their time during a global pandemic. And I think most people understood, well, that's nuts. So one question I had is like, how do you like so clearly identify what's nuts? And then at a certain point, you be you're in this line where you don't know what's nuts anymore, right? So how are we establishing the rubric for what makes that untenable and how can we make that more explicit to ourselves so we, we can use it to, because we do want to provide some experiences that depend on presence, whether that's synchronous or not. So the overlap between presence and attendance, I think, is slippery. How can we aim more for presence and less at attendance? I don't know. I think back to my uh, the online courses I've taught. I've never had an attendance policy for online courses because it was just based on the work. Um, so either you did the work or you didn't. There wasn't a because it was all asynchronous. So there wasn't really an there wasn't an attendance per se. Um, what I've shared with you on the screen right now is what was my attendance policy back when we met in person. Um, obviously, it's not anything that um, can still could work with. Um, fully online um, but it was based on the basic idea was to encourage conversation with students if they were missing classes um, and I think that's the principle I'm going to carry forward as I think about how to go more hybrid with my courses is how do I maintain that um, connection to students that sense of conversation that um, and also self-reflection. Um, I use a lot of self-evaluations in courses. So um, I think those sorts of things, the kinds of in individual check-ins that I did. So once we went into our current situation, I communicated a lot with my students. And so my sense of their attendance was very much a matter of, did I actually know what was going on in their world at all? <laughs> um, or had I heard nothing from them? And so that's where I began to, to think about that. But I think it's a, a huge question for the fall. And I'll stop this share now. Feel free to unmute and ask your questions or share your thoughts. 
Yeah, I think engage, Liz has brought up engagement in classes now as a really important criterion. Can I ask a question? Hi, Laura. I have cats in the background. I apologize if it's noisy. Um, so I really liked your discussion about changing assignments to sort of make them plagiarism proof. That's not how you phrased it, but you know, like think rethinking the way that you're having students engage so that the you know cheating or whatever is not like necessary or possible. But I'm also wondering, um, thinking ahead, like we do have the academic integrity policy and a procedure with different sort of degrees of things and, and things. And I'm just curious, like, uh, that's in place. We voted on it as a faculty body, what your thoughts are on that. I'll, uh, I'll say I did have one plagiarism case this semester um, of someone submitting something at the beginning of the semester that then we had to sort of deal with after the, after the remote transition happened. So I still went through the policy, but then I sort of felt like, oh, it was so awkward. It's always awkward, but it's so awkward in the remote setting. Anyway, I'm not, that's not really a clear question, but I'm just curious your thoughts, Matt. And yeah, I think I've been through the, the academic integrity policy in both of its old form back when I was a teaching lecturer um, and the new one. And I will, the old form I, I dreaded because <laughs> Um, I just was terrified of a student ever plagiarizing or, or myself ever even noticing that they did because it led to such a difficult situation for all of us. The current one, ha at least at the, the first instance, allows a lot of leeway to faculty and that's why I think it, it works pretty well um, because now if a student is doing something that seems plagiaristic, for instance, I I now have the freedom and the opportunity to engage in a conversation with them. And again, like so much of this, it comes down to conversation. Um, and there's less of that feeling of an ax hanging over both of us, because I don't know if you ever went through an, an integrity meeting in the previous form, but it felt like you were being judged as well. Um, and it was really terrifying. Um, so there's less of that feeling of the ax over you. There is the opportunity to you though, to move it up to a more formal, um, situation. So for me, it's always just been about connecting with a student and seeing why they did what they did. I've learned a lot, I think, from, from Susan Bloom on trying to think through the student's mindset. And I think especially now, it's like if students are feeling pressured to do all sorts of different things, where is that coming from? What are these pressures in their lives? Is there a way I can help them with that? Not so much to relieve the pressure, but to help them deal with it better. Um, so that's what I tend to try to think about now, but um, certainly, and there are certainly legitimate cases where things are just students are being recalcitrantly uh, lacking integrity <laughs> and we have to have ways to deal with that, right? We have to be a, a, an academic institution, an institution of integrity. Um, but I do start from conversation as much as possible. Thank you. <laughs> I think it'd be so cool if somebody could, and, and probably somebody has, maybe you could find it, but, you know, put together this stuff that Matt's talking about with the attendance, grading, seat time, quantification <laughs> because i do feel like just one thing that noticeably gets lost is the you know not in that stuff um it might be lost there too no no i'm <laughs> you're doing the opposite is is just how learning you know like falls away and measuring replaces the conversations about mm -hmm. learning and i don't know if i have a problem with measuring in general i don't think that i do but the the standing in, you know, the measuring standing, the conversations about measurement, standing in for conversations about learning is the thing that really drives me crazy. Um, and I think a lot of times when we're just spending so much time talking about these policies, and we're just spending so much time talking about measurement. And I guess I'd feel okay with that if I also found us spending all sorts of time talking about learning. But sometimes I feel like we don't 
have those conversations as much, especially institutionally, you know, so. Well, and I, I think that we, we also kind of get stuck in a particular way that we're going to have conversations about measurement instead of learning. I, I once heard a story, um, no names, about a student who was brought on a, up on academic integrity issues because in a programming class, he didn't understand the one method that was being taught for whatever the algorithm was. And so he went out online and he learned another method for doing that. But because he didn't use the method that was taught, the instructor accused the student of an academic integrity violation. And, and actually the student was found guilty of that. And I think it's because people on the panel didn't really understand sort of how computer scientists work. We would never do this stuff from scratch. We would always go and look and, and see how other people had done it. So I, I, I don't know, there's something about this idea of what learning is even, you know, in terms of how we, how we approach the things that we're gonna measure and assess and yeah, I don't know, that's, yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, point out, however, I've had situations in which a, stu a, a solution presented to me didn't resemble anything that I had done in class. Uh, okay, that made me a little bit nervous. Then to see the use of calculus in a course that did not involve calculus, also made me wonder who actually had done the solution. Uh, but the real clincher was when the problem number was correct, but neither the chapter nor the text apparently fit anything that I was involved with. In fact, the student didn't even know what text the problem came from. In other words, when you see a solution with an alternative methodology, it doesn't mean that this is dishonesty in action. However, uh, it's a flag that you can pursue. Uh, I'm, I, I would like to know more about the case that was just cited before deciding that this was an overreaction of some sort. We're not surprised you're asking devil's advocacy types of questions, Dennis. <laughs> I, I guess I would see it as a moment of conversation rather than a moment of accusation. And, and um, I'm not sure that always happens. Yeah, I think that's what changed for me the most is my, my mindset about academic integrity changed was that it was always before it was I, I would find something you know, a student paper that clearly they hadn't written and it felt like, okay, now I have to accuse them and we have to go into this judiciary experience. Um, whereas now it's more starting from conversation and trying to figure out what happened with the student and then also trying to help the student understand why this either why this probably isn't a good thing or what did I misunderstand or that sort of thing. So to bring learning really into it first. Yeah, I would echo that, Matt. And I had never been through the old procedure, but I found going through this procedure, it really felt like that was a possibility to make it a learning experience as opposed to a punitive experience. So I think that change that we made as a body was really helpful. And it still feels it kind of judicial. Because it is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately, but, but it's less than it was. The old one was scary. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and just speaking on general principle, go ahead, I always, go ahead Robin. <laughs> I will go ahead to say, go ahead, Eric Burtis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, that, you know, mistakes like this are, in general, there's just huge learning opportunities. We just don't learn through success. So, you know, approaching it from that perspective, I think has helped me as a teacher in the past uh, when I've encountered the same situations. 
Yeah, I was going to say in the old system that we had, um, I was a very young faculty member and I, I took a student before the board who had to, you know, plagiarize a, a paragraph or two in an in a English paper. Um, and I, I actually cried through the entire hearing because I felt like I was a being abusive, you know, like it was a, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience because I could not identify um, any saving grace to what we were all experiencing. And I knew that even as a young faculty member, I actually could have handled this as part of my job as a faculty member, like because I could have taught my way through it, but I was prevented from, you know, it's nice to know what institutional backing you have for different kinds of things, but um, I'm glad to hear the new one feels better. I haven't been paying that close attention to it. Um, I see a Medi there. Um, yeah, so Medi's talking about if, I am asked early enough by a couple of students, for example, I will move deadlines for the entire course. You know, um, because of the university policy of treating all students in the same way, I, 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 often, I mean, and sometimes I'll make exceptions for students who have really exceptional situations, but I always find myself like, it's so naive. I mean, I should know by this time, but. <laughs> I, I always feel stuck by that. And I'm seeing what Liz wrote there uh, just before I posted that about deadline flexibility. But one reason we also have deadlines is so that you can move on to the next topic. But yesterday's discussion of um, modules maybe will help me think it through, I don't know. Can we use a lot, um, I'm probably Matt was just about to talk about this um, and Martha talks a lot about this too, but um, we've tried to complicate the idea of deadlines a lot in our program. So we figure out why we have a deadline, um, whether it's for time management for the students' sake, whether it's because that day we're going to have group work. And if you don't bring your, you know, if you don't bring your poem to the workshop, workshop's going to be pretty bad. So we try to explain that as part of the deadline. And so sometimes we develop different labels. We tend to use things like hard deadlines, soft deadlines. Um, but helping students understand, you know, otherwise they're just arbitrary deadlines, right? Like she said this because she's the boss and then you're either going to follow the boss or you're going to rebel against the boss. But like, these are not useful things, I don't think. So helping them understand why those deadlines work um, because sometimes you absolutely have to stick to a deadline or you really let down a team or, you know, all sorts of things, unless of course there's really extenuating circumstances. Yeah, I, I found now I explain all my deadlines to students. I didn't do this before and, and it's been revelatory um, because there are things like in our intro to IDS course, we have to have students bring in their stuff for workshops. If they don't have anything done yet, we can't do anything. <laughs> I tell them we're just gonna be sitting here staring at the walls. Um, so there are reasons why I, I, I've distinguished in my uh, syllabi between soft deadlines and hard deadlines. Soft deadlines being things we can work around if stuff comes up. Hard deadlines is ones that there are really good reasons why they're there. And sometimes the students will ask you for them. Like if you're doing real crowdsourcing of policy in your classes, um, I do find that mostly students do not want full, like pass it in when you want. Um, <laughs> I've even had some classes because I usually let my students set most of these and I've had some classes where students are like, we want hard deadlines and we want you to tell us no and bring down our grade if we, you know. So I think sometimes you have to ask students what kinds of flexibility are helpful to them and what kinds of flexibility actually leave them feeling lost. And I have found big differences in working with first year students versus yes. seniors on that question. Um, you know, not ubiquitously, but a lot of times I think uh, my first year students, like when I've taught comp in the past, they were much more interested in having um, a little bit more structure um, and more concerned about being left to their own devices on time. I had a student that I had, I, I, I think about five hours of conversation with him uh, to explain uh, the laws of physics, I guess. The student, 
I had homework assignments and I had a calendar for the semester giving the due date of every homework assignment. And I told students in the class, look, if we get behind, I'll rewrite the calendar, there's no problem. But this one student wanted more time on each assignment. And I said, that's fine. He wanted a couple more days that, on each. And I said, that's all fine. But he also wanted to finish with the class at the end of the semester. And it actually took five hours of explanation to say, I'll give you one, I'll give you the other. You can't have both. If you get behind two days on this assignment, by the end of the month, you're a chapter behind. And by the end of the semester, you're a test behind. So you can't have both. It's not me, it's like reality. You know, we say in physics, it's outside the light cone. You can't do that, right? Uh, so I am- it seems like a help. What? Go ahead. A helpful distinction. Oh, yeah. You know, if, if it's a time-space continuum issue, then yes. you might yes. have to stick with the deadline. And um, snowballs are real. <laughs> you know, that's what I tell students is oftentimes when they're asking for extension, like, it doesn't make a difference to me, but if you keep falling back behind, 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 it's just, you're gonna be miserable. Um, um, before we, we finish up, Robin, yeah. yep. just I wanted to put, Nick Helms has put in a wonderful piece into the chat. That's a link there um, with Aso Anui's writing on some of this stuff has been stuff that I've looked at. I don't remember where I first found it, maybe from Nick, um, but it's really well worth um, digging into He's come up with great systems through the list so we'll put that with the resources for this workshop um and i'm gonna thank matt so much and all of you for contributing to the conversation i'm gonna stop recording now